And thanks for everybody for coming. Are we going to start up? Yeah. Oh, we're live. Okay. So, I don't know if I need this or not, but uh, first off, thanks everybody for coming out on this day with the rain. Um, we have some great panelists and about 15 communities represented, both here in person as well as online with people streaming through Facebook. Uh, some people are streaming as far as Chicago, Virginia, North Carolina, Florida, Montreal, and Greece. So, uh, many of you, I think, are, are new to our forum and as well as our, our kind of uh, Kinonia setup. And so, I'll explain quickly what Kinonia is. It's a we, we started a community organization in 2015 that was really kind of inspired to supplement what we saw as a six-month. Greek dance cycle that we kind of have here on the West Coast, meaning uh, we start in September, maybe sooner. Uh, we dance at festivals, but realistically we go from September until February, take breaks, and that's the extent of, of a lot of our Greek dance experience here on the West Coast. Um, and we want to expand that by creating workshops that we do in the spring uh, at different communities with uh, many of these instructors up here as well as others who gave their time, um, as well as community events like the one we have on November 19th that is our, our Winter Glendy, that will be our second annual Winter Glendy that's, that's a lot of fun and we encourage you to attend. Um, beyond, beyond just doing those events, we really aim to kind of connect directors and dancers from different communities to kind of create one, one Greek dance community, or one Greek community that where your dancers and you as directors felt connected. and. In many ways, we also want to teach dancers how to break beyond what they know just with their shows. Meaning, oftentimes at Glendia, you see people stand up and dance when their musicians are playing their exact set from FDF, but then they sit down because they don't know what's next. So a lot of our workshops are aimed at introducing new regions to communities um, and, and dancers so that they can participate and really expand um, their involvement and understanding uh, beyond just that 10 minute show. So this year we decided to bring this director's form and judge's form into the mix as well. Uh, and a big reason for this is because we, we feel the directors are really uh, one of the key components or the key pieces to the FDF puzzle or just the dance puzzle here on the West Coast. Um, you know, we believe that we need to support, train, and more importantly, continue to inspire new dancers to direct. And when they do become directors, give them the right resources and the right training so that they can then in turn give their dancers a great experience. Uh, and I think that's, that for us, that's really how we see this uh, continuing on, is, is how can we improve uh, and support directors so that these dancers, it's not about winning medals, but learn the right way, are informed and taught, and just have a really good experience, and are able to create a connection, not just uh, to their culture, but with each other and their directors that will last a lifetime. So, this structure, we're going to have two panels, basically the way today is going to work is we're going to have, we're going to try and keep to about 45 minutes uh, each panel. We're going to have a director's panel first, um, and then a judge's panel. Uh, it's going to be a moderate discussion with myself, and we'll have questions and answers from the crowd afterwards, and we'll do our best to accommodate everybody that is streaming online. Uh, the concept of the way that the discussion is going to go today is really kind of the chronological life cycle of how you go about creating a show and how what takes place at FDF next from the judge's perspective. In addition to in addition to the the forum today, we're really trying to work on a few other resources that kind of help continue to connect us as directors so we can support each other, um, as well as connect us with the resources that will allow us to um, teach and be successful as, as mentors to our dancers. So we're going to be doing a few things. One is we're going to try and create a director um, directory with names, communities, contact information, regions that they performed, costumes that they have that they may be willing to share or rent or whatever else, so that we can really continue to work together to kind of strengthen the infrastructure that is FDF here on the West Coast. The other thing we want to do is we want to create a resource directory. And one thing that was shared with me is that um, I saw this week, is HDF has a great listing of uh, dance instructors uh, that are for hire, 
Um, but we want to put together a listing of teachers and instructors, their contact info, their specialties, their areas of research, as well as requests that people that are putting on symposiums share that with them. Sorry. So we have a go-to place for directors to be able to um, understand what forms are coming up, what, what seminars, where can they go, whether it's in Greece or in the United States or in Canada. So we kind of help, uh, help provide the information on that basis where uh, people don't quite know where to turn. Um, we also have a great dance group uh, guidebook or director's guidebook that was shared with us by Pada Skibijun from Long Beach. Uh, she shared it with many multiple communities. I have some copies for people here today. It's broken down with a lot of great chapters and kind of walks um, through what directors um, sh should do or should know, uh, kind of going through the, the dance uh, and FDF process. So we have, and we can send electronic copies as well if you guys are interested, but we have a few copies up here if you want to grab them afterwards. Um, finally, if you want to know about the other symposiums and workshops that we do, follow us, check us out on Facebook as well as Instagram. Um, we also have an email list. We have a great Winter Glendy again coming up on the 19th that is definitely a throwback to, um, let's say the lobby parties by, you know, at FDF where everybody's just having a good time and dancing to, to a really great band, the VSC from Montreal. So we hope you can all join us. That said, we're gonna get this thing going. Uh, I wanna introduce our director's panel. First off, uh, we have uh, Eleni Uanu from Pasadena. Um, and I'm gonna have them introduce themselves in a moment. We have Vicky Cades from Pasadena as well. We have Dina Tabunieris. And we have Vasily Contos from Los Angeles and Long Beach. Uh, we're also going to have Georgia Garepis, who will be joining us shortly, as well as Stacy Zuberakis, who is also on our way. So, without further ado, will our, uh, our directors give us a quick introduction as to why you've continued to teach Greek dance or why you taught Greek dance, and maybe tell us what you do to try what you try to teach beyond just dance itself to to your dancers or what you want them to get out of it. Hello, how, how are you all? Uh, my name is Eleni Ioannou and I'm from Pasadena. Um, as you were asking us the question, I was thinking about uh, why I do this. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I guess nobody knows in, in October why we do this, why we signed up for this. But um, I guess to make a long story short, number one, I love, love, love to Greek dance um, from the inside of myself. Um, so that's the first part, but the other part that I really love is I love connecting groups of people. So it's really fun for me to get a group of people that usually don't know each other. For some reason, we're always starting new adult groups at our church, and um, it's kind of a free-for-all. Anyone can join and anyone can come, and um, it's our, my goal is to get this group of young adults to get to know each other and to have this shared experience of dance. and each other. I feel like there are not very many outlets now for young adults to hang out. Um, it's all electronic. I don't know if you guys know I don't have a Facebook or an Instagram or anything like that. An iPod. No, I have a CD player, okay? That's it. Um, my dance group makes fun of me to no end. But um, I think the human connection is missing and I feel like we're so lucky to be Greek and to have this thing called Greek dance um, where boys and girls of all ages get to hold hands with each other. And I know that sounds funny, but if you ask them what they do at school, like sometimes they're not allowed to touch each other, they're not, you know, and so how are we supposed to relate to each other as humans if we can't even be together? Um, and then I feel like everyone here has had that moment where you're dancing with a group of people and all of a sudden, I get the chills when I think about this, but you guys are all on the same step. You're all doing the same exact thing at the same exact time and I feel like that doesn't happen in American dancing where I too tease my kids about like, you know, everyone's doing their own thing. Where, and, and so um, we have a DJ in our community and he keeps telling me the most popular songs at clubs are the ones that like tell you what to do. You know what I mean? And why do you think that is? Because at some point people all want to be connected. And so to make a long, long story short, that's why I do it, to, to teach dance, but mostly to connect people. I'm sorry. <laughs> why, 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 why do you teach and what do you try and uh, instill in, in your dancers beyond your dance? I'm not teaching this year, but um, 
For a long time, I just taught so long just because that's just what I did. I mean, I've been going to FDF since the 80s. I've been teaching since the 80s, and I've never missed an FDF. And I've, I've almost had a group, almost all the FDFs, not all of them. <coughs> and I think that besides the dance, which, you know, my family, my parents, my grandparents, we used to dance, which they don't do at parties anymore, at houses anymore. Anything we were at, my young family would dance. And we would all dance, no matter what. There was always dance. So it's just always been part of my life. And then with the component, like why I directed, I also directed because now that you now have a son, it's so important for him to participate in FDF or something where he can meet people. I mean, as y'all know, I met Louis there. Mm -hmm. I've met Michael Bayi there. I've met all my best friends at FDF. That relationship with the Greek community, no matter what, I've you know I've gone to schools, gone to college. I don't talk to those people anymore, but the FDF people I met in the 80s, we're still friends. And so I just, I love the fact that that keeps the community together, the dance, through the dance. And um, besides Eleni, Eleni's point, I actually add another component to that. I like when the people in my DS would get married to each other. <laughs> and that's, that's, our, that's our final goal. That's our final goal. <laughs> <laughs> but if it happens, I think we had three come out of um, the original Prikaya. I think we had three couples get married. We were Kubai for once. <laughs> But anyway, so that was, you know, that's one thing I really cherish that the Greek community and everyone meeting each other and being one community together. Like that's a really important part for me. Well, I think uh, everybody's pretty much said everything that I feel. Um, I've been directing for a very long time. I've been doing Greek dance for over 20 years. And uh, I think the biggest thing for me is impact, changing people's lives. Um, I don't teach dance just because it's Greek dance. I teach because the youth need something. They need something to come to the church to feel connected, whether sometimes it's a spiritual connection and sometimes it's that way of basketball or that Greek dance. And I've been in the church for a really long time and all of my friends uh, come from a program, whether it was you know Greek school, Greek dance, or basketball. Um, my lifelong friends uh, were formed in these kinds of community involvement, community programs. So um, I, I, I think it's not. It's about teaching. It's about putting on a really good show. But it's really about bringing the youth together. It's bringing them together, keeping them out of trouble. There are people that have different things going on in their lives, giving them a purpose uh, to be a part of a team. Um, and I think that's really important for me uh, to make you feel important, to make you feel that you matter. And Greek dance does give you that. And and you're in this team environment, right? And you get to go compete. And the medal will change. You know, who cares if you win or you lose or if it's red one year, if it's, if, if it's yellow the other, um, it's the memories. It's all all those days that you get to be in Anaheim or wherever FDF is, and you get to be with your friends, and you get to have that moment, that moment in time that makes you feel um, that you're a part of something bigger than yourself. And yes, I totally love uh, you know the fact that a lot of my dancers have gotten married or been in relationships, and and I love you know that I have been able to teach and mentor and then see my dancers become great directors and you know you're I think the biggest thing for a director for me is to see your dancer be better than you to be a better teacher than you to go back into the community and give of themselves and if I um, I think that's what I feel most blessed about to see all of my dancers giving back to the community so that's why I do it to teach kids in the church so I started dancing in 1989. I was a late bloomer. I was a very late bloomer. I wasn't very good. <laughs> my mother would bribe me with toys for three years. With toys? With toys. <laughs> but one day it really clicked. Uh, and coincidentally, what clicked with me was island dancing. And it clicked very well. And I was very comfortable with it. I enjoyed it. And then. So my first year as a director was in 1997 when my peer in the group thought I would be a very good fit as being a director because we were having issues with other directors and they were going on their way. So I took over the group in 1997 and um, I guess I didn't like teaching because I was one of the kids, I was one of my peers. But you know, in the end I developed and became very, very easy for me to teach them. But I still don't think, you know, teaching is my thing. What I what I do enjoy is going out there and researching stuff that really isn't represented at FDF. Stuff that 
disappearing. So some of you may not realize that what you see at FDF is just a small sampling, but it really happens. So my drive is, and always will be, regardless if there's an FDF or not, is to research, to document, and understand how things were back in the day. I don't care too much what's going on right now. I just like going back and preserving that and bringing that back to the group, to my peers, and presenting that at FDF. Whether it's I win or lose, I know I bring something that's never been seen before, and I'm hoping one day people will look back and see what I did and hold on to that. Take my lead and hopefully preserve more. First of all, sorry I was late today. Um, so uh, I've also been doing this for many, many years as a dancer, a director, for as long as I can remember. Um, I definitely have a passion for it, and even though I keep saying every year, this is my last year, this is my last year, it doesn't happen. Um, there was a period of time, probably um, about five or eight years ago, where I thought, you know, my community being a little bit smaller, that there wasn't anybody else to step up and, and take the groups and, and direct and, and do the research and everything involved. And, you know, for a period of time, I thought I had to do it because there was nobody else that was stepping up to do it. Um, but then people were stepping up and then I still couldn't get away because I was loving it so much. I did for a couple of years, but um, I, got, I got back in. Um, I just love it. I love working with, um, I've worked with different age groups, a couple of different groups, um, and just seeing them develop a passion for it as we have, that's what makes me really happy. Um, you know, just seeing them, we had a Halloween party a couple days ago and um, the kids requested, you know, uh, dances that, that we were teaching them all on their own, not being prompted by me. And I just thought that was so cool that on their own, they wanted to do Pania dances and Cretan dances and things that we've been working on. Um, so seeing them, you know, feel happy about it, passionate and having fun with it is really what uh, drives me as well. So I mean, I think as, as everybody can see, I, there's a lot of different reasons that, that everybody up is very passionate and very involved for as long as they have. Um, once they, come on in. Just come in time. In. Just in time, it's your turn. So we're, we're going through and just a quick little introduction as to uh, why you continue to teach throughout the years, why, why you've taught for as long as you have, and what you try to instill in your dancers beyond just, just dancing. Right. Oh my god, like, wait a second. You're off. Um, all right, hi. I'm Stacy the Good Eyes. Um, is this on? Yes, yeah, Okay. Uh, why do I continue to teach? So I think I've taught for like 20 plus years. Um, what I love about teaching is watching the kids dance their dances in different, completely different settings. Um, not at FDF, not at the Glenia, which is all great, but like, my favorite part is going to like high school graduation parties and at the end of the night then putting on the CDs that I've learned them and then dancing to the suites that they did three, four years ago and putting the American friends in there and dancing and trying to show them <laughs> and the little sisters coming in and dancing. That's like what makes me really proud of it. Them doing it because they just love it and that's what they do. Um, so that's why I do it. And then I see the younger kids looking up to the older kids who are doing it, and the younger kids wanting to be just like them, you know? I mean, I'll never forget once, one of my little primary kids years ago, he was doing something in school and his mom told me. He had like this goals, like the goals that I want to, you know, accomplish in my life. And one was like, you know, soccer player for Galaxy, whatever, whatever. And on one of them was, I want to be an Olympian dancer. <laughs> and he wrote it on there and he like presented it to school, you know, so it's like <laughs> <laughs> But you know, those are the, those are the cool oh, things where so they really look up to everybody and, so and that's just why I do it because I know it's a cool thing mm -hmm. so, yeah, so, so obviously everybody up here has taught a, touched a lot of lives and I think you guys all should be commended as well as directors for doing the same in your own communities and being here and watching online because you want to continue to improve or learn and take something away so that we can all each day become a little better. So let's start with 
the uh, the meat and potatoes of this all. You know, the beginning of it, whether you're, you're teaching for the first time or you're going into a brand new year after teaching for 10 years, how do you guys decide what you want to teach from a village or region uh, perspective? I mean, do you take into consideration your preferences, your dancers' abilities? I mean, what, what's your thought process when, when deciding on, a, on what to teach? Anybody want to take that start? Well, yeah. Vicky just said she lets the dancers choose. I don't. Um, <laughs> for me, I feel like as a director, you have to live and breathe whatever material it is for three to four months. And so it has to be something that I just love. And how that comes about is different. Um, sometimes I see some show at FDF, um, or sometimes I just see something on, you, Greek TV used to have nice shows. Now I don't know. but. Um, now YouTube, I guess, has stuff, but it has to be something that I just love. And then I feel like if the director loves it, then you can impart that love on other people. At least that's what I think. But I think everyone's different. Uh, and for me, I never, ever, ever look at a group and say, oh, that's too hard for them. I don't believe that. I feel like that's a director challenge. So uh, figure it out. Uh, and uh, you can teach just about anything to anyone is what my philosophy is. And I've had people say, oh, they're too young, they can't do that. And I always say, you have to have a goal that's up at the ceiling so that maybe if they get halfway up, they've already surpassed that, which was what you would have put them there anyway. So I always like to challenge, challenge, challenge. So yeah, I do not let my dancers choose their material because then I'll go, we want to creep them. Sorry. <laughs> so um, I guess my my draw is the music more, I think. Like I love playing now. I like the, it, mine is the music, like, well, which kind of goes hand in hand with the dancing. But um, when I'm thinking what I want to do, it's always been the music. Definitely don't let me dance. Because <laughs> dancers like what's fast, yeah. and I don't necessarily think fast is better. And um, what I think, as a, as you know, new director sitting here, um, I take a map of Greece. Greece has so many different parts, um, islands, mainlands, and there's different villages. And so at FDF, you see the same suite over and over and over again. But I guarantee you, there's a little village in Greece that might do it just a little <laughs> bit differently. Um, so I say, go get a map. Go look, at, I want to do an island. There's the key clouds, there's the Ionians, or the Dodecanisa. Look at it, YouTube it, see what, what they're doing. See if it's a, something of interest to you. Um, you know, put in the different islands, put in the different mainlands, and take a moment to kind of see what the dancing is about. Um, I choose, you know, a region that speaks to me, right? Because I got to teach it, and if I don't believe in it, and if I don't love it, it's not going to transfer to your dancers. So definitely pick something that you feel committed to learn, um, but most importantly, don't be afraid to go and do something different because you don't think that you're going to succeed or, or place. Um, I'm very big about not doing normal, uh, I, you know, I don't do everything that everybody always does. Um, I think about it also, how many shows are, are there in a set, right? You've got 10 groups and eight of them are doing creation. Um, go beyond yourself. Go and challenge yourself as a director. Um, and even if your dancers hate it, because it's something that's maybe slow, maybe more contained, maybe um, rhythmically harder, um, but you're giving them something different. You're giving them a new, fresh perspective. So I think that's where I start. I always start with, hey, where do I want to go in Greece today? Got up my map if I feel like I want to do island that year, and I kind of like, okay, what's this little rock? Um, and then I and I just start, and that's kind of my base. So that's what I would tell you guys. I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess the, the question is, and, and if you have something to add, please add, but I mean, the next step, I mean, and you kind of highlighted it, Dina, is you're deciding what to do. You kind of start to, to pick or you kind of know, let's say, what you want to do. The next step is kind of research, which is a big hurdle, especially for new directors. Um, and, and that research, a lot of times, can also dictate what you're doing. A lot of times, you might be doing Thracian because somebody passed down Thracian research to you from your community, and that's what was there, and that's what you have, and you don't know where else to go. Um, I know a, lot, a long time ago, but even before I was directing, um, Charles Kiriakou had 
a video library that you could look up videos and send twenty dollars in and get copies, and that was a great first step for directors as they started to figure out what they wanted to do. So, so I guess the question is, you kind of have an idea of what you might be interested in. Um, many of you have done first-hand research. You know, we all have gotten research from other places as well. How do you go about that research process once you have an idea or a light bulb of what you think you want to teach your group? Here, I'll add to that. Um, so what I typically do if I want to do a region, I won't learn it that year I'm going to teach it. I have it in my back pocket maybe three or five years prior. My recommendation is for the new directors, if you're going to teach something, make sure you know it very well and you're passionate about it. I can assure you it's very stressful, but if you're learning it and teaching it at the same time, your outcomes are not going to be the same. So I highly recommend you have something in mind you visited, you're passionate about. If you know it very well, believe me, it'll come out very passionate and will transpire into your to your dancers. So start early and don't start the same year because it's not going to come out the same way. Um, yeah, I totally agree that you have to be very, very passionate about what you're doing because um, you're going to immerse yourself in it. Um, and um, as far as research goes, um, for me, it's been very helpful to have that expert come in because unfortunately I might not get to go to that region in Greece and dance with the villagers and that's, you know, that that's the best way to do it. But that's not realistic. You can't always do that. So to have um, that expert come in and work with me one-on-one -on -one or my team of directors and to work with the kids and that's kind of the base and then work off that. And, um, you know, I know there's that you can, um, go on YouTube now and find anything, you know, but you have to be able to decide if that is a good resource or not. Um, so, you know, I always go back to that person and say, okay, this is what I found. Um, is this something that, you know, I can use or not? Um, and they kind of guide me in that way as well, because it can get overwhelming sometimes. Um, but uh, as far as finding, you know, people to work with and, and finding those experts, you know, if um, you've seen another group do that reach and talking to, to directors from other communities, you know, I think everybody's willing to be very helpful. Um, talking to judges, they can kind of direct you and, uh, and, and, and help you in that way. But um, for me, that's, that's what's really taken my understanding to a much deeper level. So yeah, when it comes to research, I think YouTube is a very, very valuable resource, but it can be very, very detrimental to you as well. Um, and it is just double checking and sending videos, sending, sending links to the people that you know are experts in that area and double checking. Um, but as far as like regions go, I agree with what everybody said. What I typically see is I'll uh, pick let's say an island in the Kiklavis that might be a very difficult island, but kind of on the series, uh, wavelength as I might think that that island may be good for them maybe in two years or three years and so this year I'm going to start with an island that has a little bit of a simpler style and then eventually move up to the next island that's a little bit harder and then go to the island that's really hard. Like I don't want to just jump into let's say the Kikladis island of Kitnos who has you know very complex styling before doing not so or Pados or something that might be a little bit simpler to them. So I do like to kind of um, go up difficulty wise as far as styling goes, start out with something that's a little bit simpler until the group really grasps it and then continue on. Um, so that's, that's it. So then we, you guys kind of highlighted a few different sources, right? There are some of the experts, whether they're from Greece that you can bring or Joe Graziosi or someone else locally that has taught that before. Um, there are some symposiums. I mean, have, have you ever gone to symposiums to at least get that groundwork or kind of find something you think you might want to teach? And if so, which which symposiums have those been? Where have they been located? Anybody? So there's a, a variety. I've been to Canada. They put on, um, there's two versions. Uh, they, one is Quironomia, one's Logonathia, and they, they alternate. Um, and they put on a really great workshop. Um, there's some in Greece, obviously, and that's very expensive to get to, uh, and I understand that in the summer months. Um, Kinonia 
has actually started doing some workshops here. Um, back when not in the day, because I'm a relic, we used to have, you know, Seattle, we used to have OPA and Vegas and all of these tools that I feel that the younger generation now doesn't have um, as much of. But again, um, I preface, you know, finding your region, right, with looking at YouTube just to kind of see. I'm not saying it's right, but it gives you kind of an idea if you're going to like it. Um, also, you guys are, it's a social media area. And you can find the, if you Google, um, the Likyon, right? Likyon or Nidon of whatever village it is, or a mayor, or somebody. There's, back in the day, there was no internet. You know, you had to find a friend of a friend of a yaya of a papu in a pueblo, and you called Nito on the phone, and you hoped that you would get a VHS tape. You guys have this wide world web at your fingertips that give you guys some starting point where you can call somebody in Greece or find somebody or Facebook friend somebody from the island of Mykonos or from the island of, or, you know, from whatever, Ipiros, and say, hey, you know, do you know anybody? And then deduce from there. Yes, we have experts here. We have beautiful judges. We have a lot of directors with a lot of history. You have people in your own community that have a lot of resources and directors. Um, and that's also a good base, right, to, to go and start research of, you know, uh, with a director that had something to kind of show you what's good versus what's bad when you're looking at something. Um, but again, there's there's a variety of ways, right? Workshops are one. Um, two is social networking yourself, trying to find a contact. Um, and maybe you'll find somebody that hasn't been used before. Um, and then, you know, two, going through the staples, people that you know are, are have been doing this for a long time, whether it's your judge's base, whether it's your, um, director base um, or any other professionals that have come out and hopefully this directory that you know you're trying to uh, set up would help you guys in that so, so let me ask this how many different resources or videos do you guys send to use and we talked about vetting them either through uh, let's say you find them online you get them somewhere else through, through other people that you trust that have some insight into the area uh, you might reach out to the judges um, how, how many resources you guys kind of use to really kind of hone in on what you think is correct and what you want to present. Do you guys use multiple videos, multiple resources? What's your what's your approach there? Stacy, you're shaking your head. Me? Sure. Yeah. Um, I at least get when I talk to people probably two two to three different sources. Um, if I'm looking at YouTube, I will try to at least find five or six different sources that are good sources and watch the videos. Um, and what I watch for are just the intricacies of the steps and um, how each person is doing those steps. Um, and yeah, so about two, two or three people, five, six different sets of resources, make sure that they're all the same. And, and if they do differ a little bit, how do you guys kind of finalize what you think you want the step to be or what you think is correct? Well, I, think, I think after you look at all the videos, you'll get the gist of the styling, the way that the body moves, the way that the weight is distributed, the way that the steps are done. Once you understand the generalized style for that village, then you start looking at the nuances of the steps. Because everybody has their own style, but that own style is still confined to the styling of that village. And so what you have to do is say, okay, now I understand the style, but now this person has a little fling in his step, whereas that person bends a little bit deeper, but it's all still correct, but they're all a little bit different. And so I catch all those nuances, and then what I do is I try to incorporate that into my group. So if I have somebody who might be um, a little bit heavy in her steps, I might give her a style that is good for her. If I have somebody that's a little bit bouncier, I'll give her a step or a little fling that, that's good for her. So I try to individualize it based on what I'm seeing on those videos. But you get a generalized idea of how that style is supposed to be. Just one I had on that one. So if you are looking on YouTube, clearly that's the majority of the people are doing that, whether it's you can't afford to go to Greece or not, but you just need to be careful with performances. Yeah. Granted, it's there, it's on a silver plate. Not much to think about, just copycat to some extent, and you're good to go. But my advice to you is not to utilize performing groups as your resource. There are many other sources you can use, Granted, there may be chaotic, which is the best resource in my opinion, but you have to look and sift through the people and, and find the right people. 
Um, good rule of thumb, if you see a performance and they all look the same, cookie cutter, it's a red flag, it's not a good resource. It's impossible. No one's, no one, not the same 20 people will dance the same, ever. One thing I know is really difficult um, to do, and I've been very fortunate coming from Seattle and you know being with those groups for a long time, and then now with Pasadena, is if you can actually get the chance to dance with someone from that region, that's where you really learn. When we brought out everyone from Las Vegas, or we brought out you know in Seattle, we bring out different people from, I guess we brought from everywhere in Seattle and in Pasadena. We're, we're fortunate that our board helps us um, spend the money to bring out people from that area. And when you dance next to them, I don't care every time you see it, when you feel it next to you, it's completely different. So that's, I know it's a, it's a financial, it's, it's hard, but if you can get it in the workshops and the symposiums, especially the Canadian ones, I think um, most of us have gone to those. Those are good. And there are some older videos that are still floating around from the long time ago. What was, did you say Yopa? The Yopa, the Yopa, Yopa. The Yopa where in Greece they brought the groups to a central place oh, to yes. demonstrate their village. And there's still, I know that Paula Darlas, he directed in Pasadena for a long time. She's got, and I'm sure it's not just her, she's got videos, she would go to symposiums all over and she has, um, she saved them on, they're on uh, VHS or something like that. And she'll give it to anyone that's interested. And they have, they covered lots of different regions. And I know I've used them, I think I even was, used it last year. I know it was last year, her old videos. So, so everything you guys are talking about, whether it's going to Greece, bringing people here, uh, doing video research, takes a lot of time and effort and, and energy. And I guess a lot of times, let's say you're flying to a symposium, you're flying to Greece, you're bringing somebody here, you know, you want to be prepared somewhat. What, what, how do you guys prepare before working uh, with a, an instructor or doing research in a village or going to a symposium? What do you know? How do you know what you want to get out of it going into it, and how do you prepare? And what kind of what kind of questions you want to get? Do you want answered or information you want to draw from that experience that kind of allows that to be a successful, um, a successful, I guess, research opportunity? Uh, you have to prepare a lot beforehand. Uh, so someone said that they think that directing is only a two hour commitment a week and that's a big lie. So directors are the, are the ones that are watching everything before. Um, and I think you have to w watch as much, talk to as many people, know as much stuff about it before you bring the person out. Because if you don't do that, you don't even know the questions to ask them. Um, so I think you have to prepare a lot, many, many, many hours and watch different things. And I actually get the most out of watching bad performances. Um, I think you have to watch good videos, like a real, but it's very interesting if you watch bad performances, you're like, oh, okay, I see that. That's not how it's supposed to be. Um, and then you can start asking the questions like, okay, well, what exactly is this? Or what is this theme or tradition? Um, I also think that preparing means um, putting the dances into context. I hate when people say, oh, this is a dance from our first day or our second day, right? No, um, you have to understand what the dances are and when they were danced and, because some of them are happy, some of them are sad, some of them are different. And so for me, I like to understand that part, the context. And that's, and those are ma the majority of the questions. I feel like the dance steps are here and there. You can add you know, one or two questions to get the steps, but to get the context of when and why and how and who danced them and, uh, and who was, what was the order of the, um, Lineup and all that stuff. Well, I think along those lines, I think along those lines is making sure that your kids know what you're doing, because a lot of times they don't know the names of the dances, and that drives me insane. So it's, I think it's really important as far as them getting a history. Like I know, I would take a map in, and I show them what we're doing, and I really break it down. I would show them videos, even when I I said I didn't let them choose their dances. Sometimes I kind of let them think they are, because I'll show them videos and I say, "What do you guys like? What do you like about this?" But I wanted to I, I try to educate them the most I can on the actual dances in the area. So they're not just, you know, someone asks them an FDF or wherever, oh, where are those from? And they're like, I don't know. It's, it's, it's horrible. Do you, guys have, do you guys have your dancers watch the same videos that, that you used to prepare? Yeah, 
I think it's huge uh, keeping your kids in the process. I don't care if they're young kids or if they're older kids. I think a lot of people, because I've directed primary groups to advanced senior groups, so a lot of people think, oh, they're little kids. They don't. They don't need to. They don't need to know, or they don't need to see. But how do you know to fix something if you're not seeing it? I could dance in front of any kid, and sometimes they're just not looking at me. And I could say it 15 different ways, and I can count it 17 different times, but they're not getting it. And sometimes you need a visual. You need something visual to sit down and show them. And you know, so something that I do with my dancers, just you know, not only just your research, but. Um, I dance between two dancers and I see them doing the step wrong. And I bring them up in front of me. And I look at my group and I say, okay, let's let's watch. And I'll put on the video, I'll show them the video, kind of the styling, and then I'll, I'll say, okay, look how look what's going on. How is my body dancing differently than the two people flanking me? And so sometimes you need that. You need that visual. Because no matter how you say it, no matter how you break it down, sometimes it just doesn't click until they have that. Um, so sharing your research, is a good thing. Um, it's a good thing. Again, in context, right? You don't want to oversaturate them with 17,000 videos. Pick the one that you really want them to master or something that you really want to show them. Um, but in regards of, of uh, teaching, context is huge. And I think that's what's lacking here at, at, in FDF, personally, when I see sets. I'm from Carpathos. We're very traditional. Certain dances don't happen before other dances happen. Uh, you know, women can't just get up out of their seats and, and go dance. Uh, but that that is the rule in other places, not just where I'm from. So my thing is, do you know what the rules are? What is the context of the material that you're teaching? Can this dance come before that dance? Oh, I know you like the song and it might be your jam, but it might not be the jam that needs to go first, right? Because in that village or in that place, mainland, it's not what it starts off a Lundy or starts off a wedding. Or so, in, you know, learn the history of the place that you're trying to teach as well. Um, as the material. I would say my observation of FDF. I right know that the mentality right now, the approach is showcasing the dance after a dance after a dance. But what you really want to do is showcase the process. So when you do that, the dances fit in, there's a logical order. Nothing's made up. There's a natural order. Typically, group directors don't showcase that. Either it's not exciting enough, or they just don't know. They just went to the symposium where it was actually lacking. Maybe they only got 60% of the information, which is an issue with going to symposiums because sometimes you don't get the full picture. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a good point. I mean, a lot of times with the symposium, you get the gist, but you don't have the details. And a lot, and you, the same thing with those videos where you gotta take things one step further. Um, so some of the details you're talking about, Vasily, is that like how somebody orders a dance or how the music progresses or the natural order of things or what are some of the details that you're thinking of that people need to go one step further when developing their shows? Right, some things you need to think about is how it's initiated. I'm just getting examples. For the most part, it may happen in Thrace and Macedonia, but I don't know because I don't know. <laughs> but it always starts with the men, right? Either they're singing, they're drinking, they're revving up for the, the actual dance part. And normally they initiate the dance and the women come in later, for the most part. I'm generalizing right now because it varies. But it's those little details that we sort of miss out. We don't showcase, we don't teach our kids. Because right now, I think our kids just think of it as a dance, as a dance that we might dance at the festival to a bazooka or something. But they really don't know that really that we have to drink up, sing our maquinadas and wind up. wind up and then dance the girl that we want to marry. Generally. <laughs> it doesn't Bobby, happen that way. That's Bobby Potts' philosophy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so George, uh, let me ask you a question then um, before we move on, because there's a lot of good stuff we're getting out of this. But you mentioned that you'll have the instructors that you bring out, let's say like Jonas mm -hmm. teach your kids. Do you do that, or your dancers rather, do you do that if you, if you don't know what kind of teacher they are, first off? Like, had you worked with Jonas before having them work with your dancers? 
Um, and do you always have, or people on the panel, do you always find it useful to have the instructor work with your dancers, or is it more beneficial for them just to work with you and then you to relay? Um, well, combination. So, I mean, when, you know, um, we got the honor of having Zunazi to come to us, um, I, I was already using his research. So, uh, when, I, when I started working with the region, um, that I, I was given that research by one of the judges. And um, so I, all I had were the videos, and I was going off that. Um, so, uh, when we found out that he was coming, um, and doing workshops in the United States, we got on that and, and had him come over. Um, and we're a smaller community, we don't have a ton of money, but um, we made it happen. Uh, so I definitely had to have one on one time, um, but he also did work with the kids, and I forgot who was saying that once you dance with the person, whether it's us, the directors, and also our dancers, um, it gives them that experience and it just, I don't know, when you, when you dance next to that person, it just, it feels different. Um, so we had to have that aspect as well. Um, so it was, it was a combination. And, and, and your dancers at that point were, were about senior category, so they were older still? Or? Yeah, they were about advanced intermediate. Advanced intermediate. Uh, yeah, so um, once that all started happening and I got to deepen my understanding and my experience, um, that uh, inspired them as well. So uh, that group in particular uh, were totally in 100%. They, they just loved everything about it, and I think it was um, having that experience with him and uh, me working with that region long enough to really get it and feel so passionate about it that I, you know, I can kind of inspire them. Um, the group that I'm working with now, uh, they really appreciate that as well, but, but not as much as, as they had because they had that experience of working with him. And, and, um, so uh, some other people came in. I mean, our musicians, they've been so helpful. Um, and they, they work with him as well. So it's all in the same, you know, styling. Um, but they, they have, you know, come in and danced with the kids and they've given me feedback as well. So sometimes you can even use your musicians as a resource. Oh, yeah. And, and, and really quick on that, because I, I don't know if we're going to have time to come back to the whole musician discussion. You keep mentioning Downey as a smaller community. Um, to bring in Zona Zizi or to have live musicians, how do you make that work financially? Do you usually share with other communities? Or how, how does that work? We try to share with other communities, but um, even if we cannot uh, have another community come in with us, we understand the importance of it and how much it enriches our experience, so we make it happen. I mean, we, we fundraise a lot. We, you know, over the years, uh, we've learned the things that work. Um, and, and just how to make it happen. Um, so uh, all the parents, I mean, it takes everybody, you know, the parents are involved, the priest is involved, you know, all the families. So, you know, I mean, we all enjoy it so much that everybody just works together to somehow or other make it happen. So, so from a time perspective, we're, we're gonna take the conversation to the next level then. Uh, you guys have picked your region, you've pulled together research, now you have your research in front of you, how do you prepare for practice? How do you prepare to, to teach an effective practice and communicate what you need to to your kids or dancers? Take that one as well, or? Um, so to prepare for practice, um, you, you know, I mean, it, it changes throughout, you know? So um, usually I just try to choose that one thing that I wanna accomplish in that practice session uh, and, and use it as the goal, whether it's teaching a new dance or working on styling or whatever that is, um, and start working with the kids on that. But you know, sometimes you can't do that for like two hours because they might get bored. You know, they reach a point where uh, you know you can you might feel like you're losing them a little bit. So then you got to change gears and you know maybe you know put on another dance that they get that you know that they really like so that gets them excited again or maybe put on a dance that they haven't learned yet, but they're going, you want them to learn and, and just put the music on and start dancing it. And uh, even though they don't know it yet, they're looking and they're like, wait a minute, I wanna learn this. And you know, they, they start, you know, it's kind of like a sneak peek. Um, and then go back to that 
skill that you wanted to accomplish for that practice session. So it kind of varied up a little bit. So uh, yeah, it depends what age group you're working with as well. But um, how much how much time do you guys spend watching videos or watching and studying a dance before you go into practice? I mean, let's say on average each week before practice, and let's say you're teaching a new a new area that you haven't taught before, or that you're presenting to your kids for the first time. Um, how much time do you typically spend, let's say, on an average week preparing for practice? Well, it kind of depends. It just depends on how comfortable we feel with the region. Um, if I'm fully prepared from September from the get-go, oh. then I may not spend as much time. So what so, does it take for you to get prepared or feel prepared in September? Um, throughout the summer, I'll do research and um, just figure out my dances, figure out the suite, get my songs all coordinated, and, and do a lot of research in the summertime. So it's hours and hours and hours of watching videos. And then I might refresh, so maybe an hour before that week of practice, maybe. Um, on a dance that I'm like, oh, I can't remember that step right, or, or what have you, just refresh. Um, but probably I would say an L, <laughs> but that's again, after a whole summer of hours and hours and hours. Of and, and I guess the point to drive home, right, is, is I think everybody up here puts in a ton of time preparing, whether it's the week of or the summer before, and then they, you kind of have that in your bank when you can recall and, and teach it. So, I mean, does anybody else have input on, on how you prepare or what you think has made you effective preparing? I think the biggest thing with being a director, and, and, and I look at the younger kids that are in the audience right now, is trust. If your kids don't trust that you know the material, you will not be an effective teacher. And so when I say trust, trust means that you need to know your material. And when you do your research, yes, it could be the summer before, realistically, we're all busy. I got kids, I understand, you guys have school, and you have things going on. So what's the reality? The reality is you should not be watching your video one hour before practice and then you walk into practice and think you're gonna teach that dance effectively to your kids. It's not gonna happen. And when I mentor my, uh, my fellow directors or in the program, the worst thing that they always say about me is that I make them get up and teach me. I say, now teach me. And they say, oh. And I say, yes, if you can't get up and teach it, whether it's in a mirror, to yourself, try to break it down and know your audience. Some of your kids, learn with numbers, right? One, two, three, and four, and five, and six. Some of them learn with bend right, left, right, left, right. Or with the, or, so you have to kind of see, go into your dance room, see, and then also look at the progression of your material. There might be a, a common theme of six steps. So you build, where it's like satia, or you build with, you know, there's, uh, you know, in island dancing, it's one, two, three, four, five, and six, right? And then maybe that comes into another dance. So kind of look at the, the reoccurring theme, and then you can build exercises from those things, whether it's uh, forward and back for island, doing up and down for sito, whether it's doing hop, step, hop for Macedonian, like lift from your, uh, you know, rear rather than your knee. There's a lot of things um, when you're looking at material, but again, the biggest thing is if you can't break it down in a way that your team or your dancers can understand whether they're five or whether they're 25, you're not going to have the respect and they will challenge you. And when they challenge you, this is the biggest thing about bringing um, other resources, right? You, you asked about bringing in people from Greece or bringing in other people. This is where it could fail epically, right? Because if you bring somebody to work with your group, and you haven't worked with them before, and they don't know how to articulate the material that you've taught, it can also undermine you sometimes, because then your dancers think that you didn't know what you were teaching. So sometimes I say, think about who you're bringing in, think about their teaching style, and if you have questions, if you have doubts in yourself, don't bring them into your kids right away. Work with them before you go into a group. Don't just bring them into your group, because all of a sudden, you know what's gonna happen? Oh my God, the guy came from Greece, and my teacher, she taught all nine dances wrong. And you know what happens? Panic. Panic, parents are calling you. You're like, oh my God, you don't know what you're doing. No, so, you know, again, it's, it's really understanding what's happened. Take a, take a moment. If you've never worked with somebody that you're bringing in, work with them on the side first, see how their teaching style is, how will it gel with your group, and then go from there. So that's kind of 
my biggest thing is you guys need to know because if you don't know and you don't know it right, your kids will not respect you and you will not have that good relationship. So is there, because I mean, I, a lot of that resonates with me, trust and preparation to, to having an effective practice to where you can move through the material, have the kids engaged, not, not get a lot of interruptions. Is there anything else critical to running an effective practice or you know, do you guys set expectations with your dancers in terms of behavior, especially if they're younger, how that's gonna be managed, parents? I mean, because you brought up parents, Dina, right? Sometimes that's a whole different interaction, especially if you're teaching younger groups um, on how you manage that whole situation. I mean, once you've prepared, manage, how do you guys manage an effective practice, I guess? It's a hard one, because I've talked to my ages. Um, for those high school kids, take away their cell phones. <laughs> and their cell phone box. Um, and we, we do do closed practices. We try as hard as we can to not have parents come in because um, kids act differently. And also, I have a lot of experience working with kids, and um, I, that comes in handy. And that's like a whole, that's like, nothing to do with Greek dance. It's how you can talk, to, how you talk to whatever age you're teaching. And so that they respect you and they, and you can be firm with them, but still loving, that kind of thing. But having a teacher dancer relationship with them as far as you're not their best friend, you're not, you know, just like parent. To me, this is like common sense, so it's hard for me to articulate. So I think that taking away any distractions is always pretty important. So there's some important stuff I wanna to get to, but really quick, we, had, we were asked from, from Adis back east about, Eris, sorry, uh, about costumes, preparing with costumes too. Does somebody just want to talk to costumes really quick be as before we jump into <laughs> how you develop your shows? Uh, <laughs> costume and shoe, yes, a uh, crazy person. Um, <laughs> we're lucky enough to have a lot of seamstresses in our community, um, and we've used other ones also, but um, costumes are really important. I know some parishes don't have resources to buy costumes or to make costumes, so um, we, Pasadena rents costumes every year. We have people that ask to borrow this, to borrow that. Um, so we do that, and I know many other communities do. Sometimes we trade um, with Northridge, we'll borrow this, you borrow that. Um, so that's a way to go. Um, but we take a costume, uh, we try to find an original one, and then my mom and I try to deconstruct it. And we're so lucky that we have downtown here to um, find things and uh, find people that sew, but I don't know exactly what you want. Uh, what, what about like, ordering? well, let's say if you don't have access to that, that original, or where do you get access to that original, or how do you find out what is right for that costume, the show that you're presenting, if you want to present the, you know, the same costume for that region? Well, it all goes back to that resource, or those resources, those professional resources, and so um, you, it, it's, you have to find someone from up there, from that area that you're doing that has that contact information, and so, if they don't have a real costume, sometimes they'll send you pictures or look in books or any one of the judges um, have a lot of information on that. Eris has an original Karamusta costume. Eris, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, just talking to people, the more people that you talk to, you'll track something down, I feel like. So let's, let's keep it here because I know before too, you mentioned context and context of the celebration or the, the event that you're trying to represent or when the dances that you're teaching are, are being danced from, you know, in that location. How do you go about developing a show? What do you really use to start your vision? I mean, because again, a YouTube snip might not be enough to give you a vision of what you really want your show to become and, and how you can get passionate about what you're gonna present or the people and the, and the event that you want to represent on stage. Where do you start your vision when you're developing a show and organizing your, your, your dance events? For me, I watch a lot, a lot, a lot of videos of different kinds of things. And every time I start SDF, my dance groups laugh at me because I say, the vision of this show is, and it's some obscure thing in my mind. And people that have worked with me long enough know that um, at FDF, when it happens, I always become very emotional because it's so, I'm gonna cry right now, it's so rewarding to have um, a very abstract thing in your mind that you want to present. <clears throat> Um, and then you, you work towards it, and then you see it on stage, and you live it, and you experience it. But um, always it's some kind, it's some moment in that time that you really like, and then, or at least that I really like, and they say, oh, 
that's what it's going to be this year. It's going to be the fall. It's going to be the summer. It's going to be Easter, whatever it is. Um, and then you you just you gravitate towards those kinds of events or those dances or that theme. So then, I guess for whoever wants to next, Vicky or anybody else, I know we've talked about how sometimes it's it's very strict in terms of progression of the songs or what will be presented or how the, the Glendy typically flows. But let's say there is some. Um, some wiggle room in, in certain places where you where you can restructure things in kind of a more organic way. What, what do you look towards? Do you look towards music, rhythms? Um, even if the structure is strict, you can still pick different melodies and how that flows and how the you know what you want your energy of the show to be and how that moves up and down throughout the ten or twelve minute process. I mean, what do you guys think through when when finalizing the music and the songs and the sets and everything else? When I look at progression, I think of, besides the vision, I totally agree with Delaney, it's like, just reiterating, you'll, at all the videos that you see, there's gonna be a few snippets that always stick in your mind, and you're like, I wanna do that, that is so cool. And then you, you just add it into this vision, and you do create this in your mind. And then, listening to all the music, you'll find melodies, and you'll find melodies that you gravitate towards, and that your kids gravitate towards. That's the other thing, when you're doing singing, find songs that they like to do too, and they like to sing. And then I'll think of the progression of melodies. So I'll change up melodies. I may not do one melody for one dance. I might want to change the melodies and maybe start off with a slower melody and then go into a faster one or a funner one or what have you. And so then that builds. So the music is building along with that dance. And then you'll go into the next one. And I, I like to use a lot of melodies. I work with the musicians very closely as far as instrumentation goes, potential solos with the instruments. So you know, highlighting an accordion or highlighting the tzabuna or highlighting whatever it may be. Um, and I think that's how we work the progression because yes, the dances occur naturally most of the time. Um, and so you have to work within, with all the tools that you have in order to make that progression work. And keep the viewer watching. And I always tell my kids, when you want people to sit and watch you. And that's what I have to think about too, is I don't want to lose people when they're watching a performance. I want people so enraptured into what we're doing that they've just lost track of everything. And the next thing they know, we're, we're dancing off the stage and they're like, oh my God, that was out. Like, I want more, you know, and that's what you want. You want people to want more. Stacey brings up a good point where there is a progression. When you choose your music, you need to understand that it's not one dance, stop, start again, stop, start again. Sometimes it's one continuous. Most often it's probably just one song with many parts to it. So you just need to keep that in mind that sometimes, granted there's multiple pieces to a, to a song and then you should add that to the progression as well. I definitely think that when you're putting your show together, if there's, if there's room, you, if you have musicians coming out, um, you know, from a music, and my husband's a musician, and so, you know, he used to get frustrated with me because I would tell him, well, I just want this. And sometimes, musically, they can't stop somewhere, or they can't pick up at another place. So you have this great idea, but they can't play it that way. And so um, I think it's really important that you have the conversation with the people that are going to be playing. If you have a tape, obviously, you can cut it and start it and do it the way that you want. But if you're having live music, it doesn't always work the way that you think it's going to work, right? It's not a cassette tape. It doesn't start and stop. Um, there are certain melodies that they have to stop on. There are certain intros that they have to, you know, come in on. Um, and, and there are certain things that can go together, and there's other things that can't. So I think it's really important to have that discussion um, with them. Keep them in the process with your idea um, to help you through. Um, again, also high and lows. I think that's a big thing that you should look at in your set when you're, when you're progressing. You don't... You know, if, if, if there's room in, in the village or the place that you're doing allows you to that, sometimes you don't want to you don't want to go at a, at a thousand and then drop to zero, and then go back at a thousand and then drop to zero. So you want to you want to tell a story, right? You want to keep them you want to keep the audience watching you. And I always say it's in the first five seconds. You want your the people to put their pencils down, and you want them to see your show. And so, what's going to help them watch you all the way through? Are you going to break? They're going to be like, oh my god, it was. Uh, they climaxed at, at, ten, at, at, at five seconds, okay, now they're, they're really slow, oh god, this is like, you know, so you want to keep them going, you don't want to give, you know, you want to build up to that big finale, 
um, that big end, that that nice show. So that's kind of so. We're, we're almost out of time. I guess the only other thing I want to touch base on, um, one, if if people in, in the audience are watching have questions for you guys, is it okay if they reach out to you? Email, whatever that is. Um, put you on the spot. Telephone. Telephone. <laughs> <laughs> Non-social media yeah. person. <laughs> um, otherwise, I, I guess. Nobody else <laughs> yeah. Via the Mulari. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so, so before a quick Q and A, um, the other the other thing that, that we that we work within here on the West Coast is FDF is a ministry, and obviously we face pressures from not pressures but but requests and and, and, and responsibilities to um, not just be dance directors but also ministry leaders, and and how do you guys balance that with with the pressure of coming in and having to teach and only having two hours? while also connecting your kids with whatever else we need to as, as ministry leaders. I mean, there's there's a lot of back and forth and a lot of friction that sometimes comes with that relationship. How do you manage that, and how do you manage that in the right way in your community? Yeah, I guess the short and sweet answer is just, um, it's, yeah, <laughs> by example, I guess. Um, you know, just the kids see us by example, that we, I know we have a new rule, I think you guys have it too at St. Sophia, the kids have to go to church so many times to be an FDF, which is, you know, it's great. The thing is, right after FDF, a lot of the kids don't come back. But I know that people like myself and Eleni, I know we still bring our kids, I know you mean, yeah. <laughs> we still bring our kids to church, and a lot of kids, they just drop, like the Sunday school classes get really small. And then, you know, it's, it's up to the parents. Like the parents need to bring their, continue to bring their kids to church. But us being good, you know, being by example, working at the festival, helping out at whatever the church needs, and then bring, I bring a lot of the, the kids, I'll bring them in. Like um, we had a Greek school event on Friday night, and a couple of my dancers were there from last year, and I put them to work. And then just, you know, then, then they do it, and they're fine. But I think by example is our biggest. And we go to FDF or any event, acting responsibly and not we re remember that we represent our church you know we represent st anthony's in pasadena and that's one thing i really hit home with the kids from pasadena before fdf is that you are a representative of the church you're a representative of father peter and if you can't go to father peter's house and what you're wearing don't wear it to fdf or you know <laughs> wherever you're going so a lot is like how we how we act as their role models because we are their role models we're, we're so, so with that, let's take a couple questions from, from the crowd. Je Jessica, you have one? Yeah. And then, Mono, do we have any questions online or? No? Okay. How do you guys decide how much choreography is enough when you have variations for your dancers? Because I think my tendency is to over choreograph with weaker or younger dancers and leave other things up to improvisation. But I don't, I think that sometimes when you over choreograph, you create too much of a rigidity and you don't create a dancer that can adapt to other sets or be improvisational on his own or her own. So I'd like to see, hear about that. I hate choreography. Mm -hmm. um, I get it. When you're new, you see a video and you want everybody to do 17 slap kicks and come out and do five turns. They don't dance that way in the Horyo. They don't dance that way in the Vuno. They are not doing 17 slop kicks and an off the chair backflip. Um, that's not how they're dancing. And and so I think it, to succeed, you know, you need to take a step back. And yes, you want to put on a show, but sometimes less is more. And I always err on that side. Like, you know, if you have excellent, you know, male leadership variations in the front, maybe it's a woman that's dancing, maybe it's a woman's dance, Focus on the key elements, but also it's not about everybody doing the same thing. That's everybody so focused on, you know, is it five centimeters to the right and to the left? You know, in the Horyo, there is Mary, you know, Poppy and Calliope, and they're not all dancing the same. But they, you know, they have this, it's the same kind of concept, but they have different ways of, of articulating their, their dance movement. And so I, I think that FDF, if, if, you know, you want to move away from that very rigid, 
choreographed set into more of a fluid, organic environment? What, 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 would, would that, would they really be? You know, you should ask yourself that question. So I always, I ask people, do you think they're really doing that in the choreo? Well, it's not so much the people doing all the slap kicks. It's like how much do you choreograph the natural yeah. and hugging yes. and kissing. Hugging and kissing? Yeah, okay. choreographed yeah. movement from transitions. It's like the walking from one side of the stage to the other. It's choreographed. I mean, yes. I, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying about, you know, choreographing the kissing and right. that kind of thing. And, um, you know, the transitions between dances, I totally get that. Because if it's not done naturally, it just looks awkward. It doesn't, you know, it just, uncomfortable yeah. um, so I, I just think um, I know we were talking about like the kids watching the videos of the villagers and the way they do it but talking to them about the culture why they're celebrating this why they're doing these dances is it a glendy like you know how how would you act at a glendy you know um, and Maybe putting on a Glendy and you know and having these dances and just letting just letting them in that just raw you know atmosphere and just seeing how you know it's, it's just it, it just looks so they just have to feel that to do it or else it's better if they don't in my opinion I don't know um, I'm feeling that, but, uh, yeah I don't know it's hard to choreograph that sort of thing in my, in my opinion I would definitely recommend no hugging kissing <laughs> and if you do use tables you know they're they're there for a purpose but don't eat off the tables on stage so don't use that as a quarterback uh, tool <laughs> don't eat off the table <laughs> have a plate don't eat on stage <laughs> do not eat <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is you also have to, do, is how many kids you have on stage. I mean, the last couple of years I was dealing with 32 teenagers <coughs> on stage and there's no room for choreography. It's just transitions took, transitions took longer than learning how to do the dance because it was so many people on stage. So, yeah. So, Jessica, do you mean like the transitions themselves and like... I just mean like if there's... Um, if you're doing an island and the, you know you're having boys solos, do you choreograph every boy solo? Meaning do what they're meaning what they're gonna do exactly the for their solo? The, yeah, exactly where they go on stage, or, or do you let them? Or do you teach them five things and have them pick? Well, well I guess the question is teach them five things and let them pick and give different music. Always, I feel Always. like the yeah. director downfall is when you just have those five songs and that ver those versions of those songs. And then, you know, the musicians come, number one, and it's a disaster because they don't play it that way. Um, but the kids didn't know that's the same dance. Yeah. So if you give them four different kinds of that song, then you'll see how they start feeling comfortable. But I feel like, personally, I think it does them a disservice to say, do it this way only. I would teach them, and then let them come up with some on their own too. Sometimes it might not be traditional, but our, one of our groups added a drone into one of their dances by themselves between Friday and Saturday of FDF, and they were so proud of themselves. They went on stage, great, because it was organic to them. You know what I mean? So I think that part too. I, I like what, when the kids do their own stuff. But. Any other questions? No? So for, for those online, we're gonna take a quick break, um, switch out directors and judges, but can we please have Big round of applause for our directors up here. One more question. One more question. Good job, guys. I just didn't get the names of everybody written down for contact for later. So we have Eleni Ioana, Vicky Cadiz, and Dina Tabonieris, Vasily Contos, Georgia Garethis, and um, Stacy Zuberatis. <laughs> That's what happens when you come late. <laughs> So, a big round of applause one more time, please. So we're going to take a quick break, grab water, some sweets. We're going to turn off the stream and come back on in about five minutes. <laughs>